Ray swore an oath to God to protect his name, his followers, and his kingdom. The military orders of the Crusades answered the call when threat of annihilation was hanging in the balance. In an all-new series, James and Joanna Bogle discuss the heroic efforts of the defense of ancient Christendom. You know, Europe is attacked from the north, from the south, from the east, uh, from, you know, and from the north, northeast as well. We really, literally had attacks on all sides. So arose the military orders and the Crusades, an all-new series here on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. I'm Joanna Bogle and I'm here with my husband Jamie and we're discussing the military orders and the Crusades. Today we've reached the Knights Hospitaller. Over to you Jamie. Tell us about the Knights Hospitaller. Who were they? What did they do? Well, uh, on the last uh, occasion we were talking about the Knights Templar. The Knights Hospitaller are similar, similar to the Knights Templar, uh, a military religious order of the church. <coughs> Their organization and structure, their aim and purpose, was in many respects um, similar to that of the Knights Templar. So you have this conception, a new idea, as St. Bernard of Clairvaux called it in relation to the Templars, in which you have the monastic ideals combined with the, um, the military life needed to defend uh, the, the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem and the frontiers of Christendom. <clears throat> so, like the Templars, they lead a religious life, they take the vows of poverty, chastity and obedience. They live in obedience to their religious superior, who is the master of the, of the, of the order, in, the, in this case the, the master of the hospital, in the case of the Templars, the master of the temple. <clears throat> and they lead uh, a religious life in that they uh, hymn daily mass, they attempt to say the offices of the church unless their military duties interfere, it's a reduced version of the office of the church. And they also train and live as soldiers with all the discipline of the camp, of the garrison, which is necessary to ensure that they are an effective force for defending the frontiers of Christendom. So, again, this is their role and they were founded after the, uh, uh, around the time of the First Crusade, the reconquest of Jerusalem. In fact, their foundation was slightly before the Templars. They really are, uh, of the two, the oldest um, and possibly, uh, I think it's fair to say, the oldest uh, military religious order uh, in, in the world. Their, their full title um, nowadays, because they still exist in a slightly different form, uh, tells already something about their history. The Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of St. John of Jerusalem, of Rhodes and of Malta. But uh, in those early days they were called the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem or the Knights Hospitaller. Nowadays they tend to be called the Knights of Malta. And so Hospitaller, they really did found <coughs> hospitals and just so we get a connection in people's minds, there is a connection with the St. John Ambulance today and that whole great tradition of St. John uh, and the, the Order of St. John, which we'll be coming to this later, but just so we get some picture in our heads, uh, where, where there are also Anglican orders and the whole, the whole idea of, of, of the, the, the uh, St. John Ambulance nurses and young cadets who learn first aid in ordinary suburbs in Britain. But there is a connection. And here in America probably too. Yeah. Yes, it's because originally they were based upon the hospital in Jerusalem. Uh, and this goes back, this hospital, some way. Uh, a, a, a hospital founded by merchants from the Italian state or city of Amalfi was founded in 1080 to provide care for the poor, the sick or the injured pilgrim who had gone to the Holy Land. And uh, <clears throat> this is, was the basis upon which the, the Knights Hospitaller 
were, were founded. But it, it goes back much earlier. In, in the year 600, Abbot Probus was commissioned by Pope St. Gregory the Great to build a hospital in Jerusalem to treat and care for Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land. And in 800, the Emperor Charlemagne, the, em- the Holy Roman Emperor, enlarged the hospital and added a library to it, of course, containing many medical texts. But it was about 200 years later, uh, the, the, from that time, uh, in the year ten, uh, 1005, as we have seen in earlier uh, episodes of this series, the Caliph al-Hakim destroyed the hospital um, and 3,000 other buildings in Jerusalem, including the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, one of the most sacred sites. It was after that time <coughs> that the merchants from Amalfi and indeed from Salerno in Italy uh, were given permission by uh, the then ruling Caliph um, Ali as Zahir of, of Egypt to rebuild the hospital in Jerusalem, which they did in the year 1023. So, from that time, it then started to become connected with uh, uh, St. John the Baptist. It was built on the site of a monastery of St. John the Baptist and it took in Christian uh, pilgrims travelling to the Holy Land. It was initially served by Benedictine brothers, uh, but it was following the First Crusade that the famous Blessed Gerard, who was seen by uh, the Knights uh, of Malta as the founder of the, the Knights of St. John, the Knights Hospitaller, uh, began to uh, bring together a group of brothers to uh, lead a religious life as they were caring for the, the pilgrims who were visiting the Holy Land. And the monastic hospitaller order of the uh, Knights uh, of St. John, the Knights Hospitaller, the Knights of Malta, was founded around that time by Blessed Gerard. Uh, and his foundation was later confirmed by a, a papal bull of Pope Paschal II in 1113. I found a rather good description of this hospital in the the rather gloriously named book How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization uh, by a chap called Thomas Woods. And um, there's a rather good description in in this book of the hospital. Uh, This is after the death of Brother Gerard um, uh, and the election of Raymond Dupuy as administrator. And the hospital really became something very big. Uh, We've got here St. John's was impressive for its professionalism, organization and strict regimen. Modest surgeries were carried out. The sick received twice daily visits from physicians, baths, two meals a day, and the hospital workers were not permitted to eat until the patients had been fed. And by this stage, it was very large indeed, and it was actually serving Jewish and Muslim patients as well as sick Christians, so it had clearly become what today we might call a a centre of excellence. And uh, apart from the thought of the poor patients having surgery without anaesthetic, it's uh, very obviously a, a very well-equipped and, and good hospital with a great emphasis on cleanliness because there was a particular thing where they employed some ladies to perform various chores, including ensuring the sick had clean clothes and bed linens. So if we think that's only a 19th or 20th century invention, they, they were there first. Yes, and the medical uh, techniques within the hospital were, were, were quite advanced. And interestingly, despite being at war with each other, the Christians and the Muslims, in effect... Uh, uh, <coughs> passed on knowledge between each other so that both um, Muslim and Christian medical science advanced in rapid stages and notoriously of course where there is a battle scene uh, and the need for um, trauma surgery for, or, or for um, highest standards of medical care and for medical knowledge you tend to get these advances in medical knowledge and the hospital in Jerusalem was one such example um, a, 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 Uh, Even from the very earliest of stages, the hospital had something like 2,000 beds. Well, that is an enormous undertaking, even by modern standards. That is a huge hospital. And yet there we are in the so-called primitive Middle Ages. Uh, They are able to maintain a hospital with such a a vast number of beds. And it's quite clear it got a lot of patronage. uh, Money came from uh, kings and princes and so on. It was a it was seen as a primary thing to do would be to care for the sick. And as you say, here it was at the the frontier of Christendom. So it received considerable uh, generous funding from people back in Europe. Indeed. Now, fairly early on in the history of the the Knights Hospitaller, um, shortly after the papal bull of Pope Paschal II, once again we see that there is an urgent need for the protection of pilgrimage. 
<coughs> not only the care of sick pilgrims um, once they arrive in Jerusalem uh, and of uh, the poor and homeless, but also their physical protection. A police force is needed to guard them against bandits, robbers, uh, and of course the invading um, uh, surrounding Muslim forces. And it is at that time that we start to see the Knights of the Hospital beginning to adopt a military vocation as well as their nursing and hospitaller vocation. Um, it seems odd that one could combine the two, but that is what they did indeed continue to do throughout the entirety of their uh, uh, existence. And their familiar uniform of a black surcoat with a white cross uh, soon became a sight uh, that pilgrims saw in not only uh, Palestine in, in the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, but also throughout and across the whole of Western Europe. And this is because rather like the Templars, they set up estates, commanderies and preceptories all across Europe so that they were able to A, fund the hospital and fund their military activities in defending the frontiers of Christendom but also to set up uh, hospitals based upon the hospital in Jerusalem all across Western Europe which is what gives us our modern idea of, uh, of a Christian hospital um, of course that existed already and was a uniquely Christian idea by the way uh, but it was given a particular boost by the ideals and by the, um, uh, the, the vision of uh, the Knights Hospitaller in Jerusalem. And now tell us a bit about this cross, which we have here over this great fireplace, um, this, this curious cross uh, with its eight points. Yes, um, we, we see that here. This is the classic uh, uh, Maltese cross, so-called for reasons we'll see in due course when the order became connected with Malta. Uh, and this is an eight-pointed cross, the eight points symbolizing the eight Beatitudes uh, seen in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Gospels, uh, and, uh, which they were meant to exemplify. And that became the hallmark, the principal symbol of, and indeed is to this day, the Knights of Malta, the Knights Hospital, and the Knights of St. John. Um, and they continue to wear that on their, their choir dress. In due course, when they became more of a military order, uh, they, they needed to dispense with the, the, the mantle, the choir dress, and have a surcoat over their armour, uh, rather like the Templars, only theirs was, was red with a white cross on it, uh, the Templars was uh, the other way round. But they still maintained and wore, and still wear to this day, uh, their choir dress, the, the black cloak, with the eight-pointed white Maltese cross on it. Um, and that is their, their probably most uh, recognisable symbol. Again, like the, the Templars, they built huge uh, forts and castles and at the height of their influence in the, uh, the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Hospitallers had seven great forts and 140 other estates uh, in uh, the Kingdom. Uh, the two largest of their forts and their bases of power in the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the Principality of Antioch, one of those other Crusader states, was the famous Crac des Chevaliers uh, in, in, in uh, the north and the other castle of Marga. Crac des Chevaliers was such a fantastic uh, uh, edifice that it still stands to this day. You can see it if you visit uh, Palestine, uh, or should I say the Middle East, uh, because it was rather north for the north, uh, almost as if it were still in operation such a, a, an extraordinary achievement it was. So tell us more about this whole structure then. Here they are, they're running this hospital, they're running these forts. Daily life, aims? Well, they divided themselves into, into priories and sub-priories, which were in turn subdivided into bailiwicks, which in turn were divided into commanderies. So it's a very um, well-disciplined military structure that they have. Uh, rather like the Templars, they maintain this tremendous d discipline, itself predicated upon uh, the religious uh, virtue of obedience. Uh, so you have military obedience, you have religious obedience, and the combination of the two is what gives the religious military orders their tremendous discipline and strength. Um, it becomes, uh, uh, as well, uh, a source of wealth, a source of resources, and a source of assistance to uh, not only the defence of Christendom as a whole, but also individual kings and monarchs. And Frederick Barbarossa, the Holy Roman Emperor, pledges protection to them with a charter of privileges in 1185. However, again, we see um, that 
they have to shift for themselves once the kingdom of Jerusalem begins to come under threat, Jerusalem falling in 1187 as we've seen to Salah Hadin. Uh, the knights were then confined to their principal uh, base, the Knights Hospitaller, uh, of the county of Tripoli, the four um, crusader states, Tripoli, Edessa, the kingdom of, of, of Jerusalem, and Antioch, the principality of Antioch. They were confined uh, after the fall of Jerusalem to, to Tripoli. And then when the city of Acre, the last city, crusader city, was was captured in 1291, the whole kingdom falls, the order then had to seek refuge, like the Templars, outside of the Holy Land, and they did so like the Templars, in the kingdom of Cyprus. Thereafter, uh, their history becomes uh, rather different, and uh, they have a whole unique history of their own, separate from the order of Templars, because they continued, and continue right up to the present day. And, and that's where we see them searching about, casting about, to find another uh, headquarters, another base from which to, to operate. And the Grand Master Guillaume de Villara uh, hatches a plan to move to the island of Rhodes. And his successor, Fulte Villarit, executes that plan. And on the 15th of August, 1309, um, after over two years of campaigning, the island of Rhodes falls to the knights. Um, and they then settle on Rhodes, and that is why part of their title is uh, that they, they are Knights of Rhodes. And for a time they were called the Knights of Rhodes. Uh, and if you go to Rhodes, uh, you will see that they have, on that island, still many memorials to the Knights. It was around about that time that they decided to subdivide the order into various languages or tongues, long in the French. Um, because like the Templars, there was a lot of heavy French influence. Even though it was international order, uh, the influence of the, the Franks and the French was considerable. So they divided into uh, eight tongues, again, corresponding with the eight points of their cross. Aragon, Auvergne, Castile, England, France, Germany, Italy, and Provence. So you have two, you see, French or Frankish uh, longs, um, Auvergne and Provence, as well as France proper itself, so three in all. And each was administered by a prior, uh, if there were more than one prior in the tongue, by a grand prior, and the resident knight of each tongue was headed by a bailiff, a bailli. So this was the original structure of the order, uh, and again based upon the core knights of justice, who are those who have taken the full vows. Interestingly, and the same applied to some extent with the Templars, but much more so perhaps with the Hospitallers, you had associated knights, confratres, not just the brothers who were the, the primary members of the order, but confratres, those who wish to be associated, a bit like a third order. And it is that which continues to this day, so that you get uh, uh, Knights of Malta who are really uh, like a kind of third order, associated with those knights who are in full vows. And this, this system of confratres meant that the nobility of Europe, from the greatest of kings downwards, became associated closely with the order. And the order, like the Templars, uh, took on a nobiliary uh, character. And this is very important to the, uh, the, uh, the Christian idea of chivalry and the idea of both the Knights Templar and the Hospitallers, but particularly the Hospitallers. The Hospitallers have a twofold vocation, tuitio fidei, the defence of the faith and of, of Christendom, and obsequium pauperum, care of the sick and the poor. It's a very Christian vision. The greatest of the Christian nobility were as knights of the order to humble themselves to serve the sick and the poor. Nay, like uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the poorest of the poor, as if they were serving Christ himself. And this is an intensely Christian ideal and one that continues to this day. The knights call themselves Servi Dominorum Pauperum Infirmorum, the servants of our lords, the sick poor. And from the very beginning, the knights had a duty to wait upon the sick poor in the hospital of Jerusalem and all the other hospitals, serving them with the best and the choices that, they could, that could be found, and doing so often upon gilded platters. Every night, the Grand Master included, had the obligation to fulfil this duty regularly, and every Grand Master I'm happy to say, has always done so. Waiting upon the poorest of the poor as if he were Christ himself. The greatest nobility of Christendom were themselves to wait upon the poorest of the poor. It's a tremendous ideal 
and one that we can see has a time uh, and a place at every time and place uh, throughout the history of Christendom. And today, um, not all the Knights of Malta sort of do that, but at least in principle that will be the idea that they, that they should do that. So it should be, you know, soup runs or something like that. But each knight presumably is uh, obliged to try to find time in his life that he's meant to be doing that. Even, exactly. Um, plenty of opportunities in modern life to do exactly that. Exactly. And what, what is also interesting is that the, the order was itself based upon the old idea of a Catholic religious order. That is to say, it was principally lay run. These, uh, it is often forgotten, for example, that both St. Benedict and St. Francis were not priests. Mm. Uh, they were yet nonetheless the father superiors of their respective orders, the Benedictine and the Franciscan orders. The idea that a religious order should consist uh, largely of priests is a very late development. Um, the old idea is preserved in the Order of Malta, so that the Grand Master is a layman, albeit one in full monastic vows. He is the superior of the order, and the members and the clergy of the order obey him as their superior. Some people get a bit confused about this. Um, it's always been a tradition of the Catholic Church that charity is the highest vocation, um, and that being a cleric is, is a question of status rather than vocation. If that, of course, were not so, then women could not aspire to the highest vocation, which of course would rule out Our Lady herself, who has, as we know, the highest vocation among all the creatures that God ever made, yet she was never a priest. And this is recognised um, well enough by members of the uh, Order of Malta, because we see that the Grand Master uh, is himself a layman. So this idea of service to the poor, exemplified, as you say, in modern times by Mother Teresa of Calcutta, one of the extraordinary things about the church is precisely that it has always thrown up people in every generation who are prepared to do that, but not as a sort of grudging duty, but more as a rather sort of thrilling idea uh, with, with traditions associated with the orders concerned. And um, every order likes to have its own ideas, it's even the colours, and I think Mother Teresa in her blue and white sari uh, is, is, is the latest one. So the Order of Malta would give to this noble idea about serving the poor uh, a, a real structure and a certain glamour, if, if one can call it that, <coughs> which makes what should be something that is not grudging, but joyful, you know, because we're, we're all meant to serve the poor. The, it's a very attractive idea, isn't it? Well, really? it's very attractive because you see that the, the rich and the powerful become the servants of the poor and the dispossessed and the marginalised. Mm. This is an ideal which so obviously has its place as much today as at any other time. Mm. Um, rather than taking a selfish, standoffish view, the ideal of the order of the hospital was that the greatest in the land, the richest, the power, most powerful, the wealthiest, should follow the Christian ideal of serving those who were marginalised, dispossessed. And, and it is a, a wonderful ideal, wonderful ideal. But interestingly, it was, it was one that not only did it attract to the great minds of the church and the great forces within the church, but, but one that also um, recommended itself to the most powerful within the church, with the blessing, obviously, of the Pope, but also the Emperor and the kings of Europe, so that the, the Grand Master himself, as a representative of the order, became a great figure in medieval Christendom and indeed later and continued to be so right up to the present day. So thanks to the great prestige of the order, um, it moved from Rhodes, it was kicked out uh, again by the Muslims, it moved this time to, to Malta and that is why it subsequently became called the Order of Malta. And it was from that time, and we'll be dealing with that a little bit later on, that we see it, it becomes a great force within the church. The Grand Master becomes a prince. He ranks even today as the lowest of the cardinals. Indeed, it may be said that he is the last of the lay cardinals, though he doesn't have a vote in the conclave. Um, and we see today that the original vocation of the, uh, the Order of St. John, of the Order of Malta, its hospital work continues. The original work has once again become the great... Uh, uh, task of the Order of Malta and, um, uh, and the, it, it, for example in the, in the World Wars in World War I its, its activities were greatly expanded by Grand Master Fra Ludovico Chigi della Rovere Albani, the Grand Master at that time so as to be able to undertake yet more hospitaler works and today with its headquarters in Rome it continues these hospitaler works it runs hospitals, hospices clinics, homes and dispenses around some one billion dollars of charitable aid per year, itself 
a remarkable undertaking for an organization which has its origins in the defense of uh, Christendom in the Middle Ages. A thousand years old. It's, it's a remarkable story. And as you say, uh, its legacy has been imitated by, uh, by, by others outside the Catholic Church, in the Protestant uh, churches. that We have the Venerable Order of St. John in Britain, the various Johannita Order in Germanic countries, imitating this, this great ideal. In uh, the Catholic um, Order of Malta, interestingly, the present Grand Master is an English gentleman, Fra Matthew Festing, um, and his predecessor was also an Englishman of Scottish origins, uh, Andrew Barty. I mean, whilst the whole history of the order, there have never been any English or Scottish uh, Grand Masters of the order until the present day. We now have two in a row. Um, so uh, I think if you were to ask either of them about the relevance of the ideals of the Order of St. John for today, they would be in no doubt that it has as much relevance today as it ever had. The Knights of Malta. We're looking at the military orders and the Crusades. Next time, we'll be finding out about the Albigensians and the Crusade there. Join us then as we discover more about the military orders and the Crusades.